does an action. Uh, yeah. James normally does an action. That's the next thing you can get is the um, quick thing. The director's, director's station. Rebs has got flashy lights that she wants to use. Where's the beers, Rob? Cool, and we're live. Hey everyone, thank you for joining us. Welcome to our first collaboration event with Founders and Consume, uh, and we're streaming live here from Duke Studios in Leeds. So tonight we'll be hearing from four local founders sharing their insights and stories around the theme of putting purpose over profit. Yep. So uh, we're Ash and Owen, and we're from Leeds Digital Drinks, which is a volunteer-led community enthusiastic about tech, creativity, and startups, and we started four years ago right here in Leeds. So over the years, we've been involved in a range of different events from co-running the Startup Weekend to raising awareness for the Leeds Climate Commission, as well as charity fundraisers and workshops for digital skills. Yeah, so we're probably best known for our founders events, um, where we hear from local entrepreneurs and innovators in the style of short TED Talks. And we've been hosting founders for a while, uh, and especially in the last year, we've been collaborating with other organizers in the meetup circuit, um, and that's what kind of brings us here tonight. Yeah, so this uh, circuit <coughs> includes Hannah. So, yeah, Hannah and an amazing team at Consume have been successfully running their events uh, across the north of England for the last couple of years. So, yeah, I'd like to introduce you to Hannah, who's going to tell you a little bit more about Consume. So, hi, everyone. Um, I am Hannah from Consume Comms. Um, we have been running events, um, community events across the north for six years now. Um, so Consume is a little marketing agency. We are based out of Duke Studios. Um, we specialize in um, technical marketing, SEO, social media, and events. Um, we are based in Leeds, but we also have a presence in Manchester and Newcastle. Um, we're really passionate about community, um, which is one of the reasons that we wanted to partner with the Leeds Digital Drinks guys and support them with their founders events. Um, you may recall us from um, Glug events across Leeds and Bradford. Um, we were also involved in Empowering Women Tech and Leeds Digital Jobs Fair, um, amongst many other kind of techie and digital endeavours. So we're really pleased to be partnering with the, the guys tonight and um, starting our Founders Times Consume partnership and hopefully spreading the word and supporting lots of people on the way. Yeah, I mean, Hannah said it all, so over the last few years, because we've had such a overlap with our communities, it only felt natural to combine our efforts and our experience with running indie events. Yeah, so today we're starting a new series, brand new series, to bring the creative and tech folks together to develop more opportunities to collaborate and grow. Uh, so our first event in this series is all about putting purpose over profit, where our speakers will be talking about uh, finding their purpose, either through business, or initiatives that they have founded? Uh, in terms of housekeeping, we've got one planned break in the middle for wee-wees and vapes and snacks, drinks. Um, we'll also leave a few breaks open in case we have any technical difficulties with the internet or any other techie bits, which if you've seen any of my events before, you'll be familiar. Um, there are no planned fire drills, so if you come back to an empty stage, assume the worst. Um, you will find us in the Techni Car Park. Um, tonight's tickets were free, but if you would like to help us support um, Duke Studios and Sheaf Street with their, um, and the immediate business community based out of here, um, you can purchase a voucher from their website um, that will help with their current running costs, and you'll be able to enjoy that at a later date in the cafe or bar. It's me again. Socials. This is what I do for a living. Um, so we want you guys to be a part of everything, and we want you to kind of chat and um, enjoy this event being live streamed as much as you can. So we invite you to um, be active on the Twitter. Um, so you can find us at Consume Comms or Leeds Digital Drinks. So we will be keeping an eye on there. So please, you know, send us your questions, your chats. Let us know if you love it. If you don't like it, leave it. Don't bother telling us. Um, but yeah, we will also be on Insta stories. We'll be keeping an eye on those. So um, keep the conversation going on our Twitter and Insta. What's the hashtag, Hannah? The hashtag is purpose over profit or the purpose. Awesome, thank you. I think that was one of our biggest FAQs. So 
Uh, tonight's lineup, as we mentioned, we've got four fantastic speakers. We're going to be kicking off with Will, and then at which point we're going to have our break. Um, and then we're going to have Bethan, Lucille, and then finishing up with Rich uh, at the end of the night. So what we'll do is we'll hand it off to Will, um, and we'll switch over the, the feed here, uh, streaming from the other side of Leeds. So we'll pass on to Will. Hello, Will. And we're live. Hi, everyone. How's everyone doing tonight? So I'd like to start by saying uh, thanks very much to Founders and Consume Cons for having me, uh, inviting me to talk this evening and to tell you a bit about my story. So my name's Will Saunders. I'm the founder of Goodwill Studios, which is a social enterprise creative design studio based here in Leeds. So today I'm going to tell you about my journey starting out as a designer, carving my path and getting lost and depressed in the process and ultimately finding my purpose and being here to talk to you today. I'm going to share my screen and get this going. <clears throat> so this is me, the nerdy kid who loved to draw. I've, I've always been a visual person. I used to be called artsy as a kid. And the highest grade I ever got in school was actually in art. And even though that was just a B, I was quite proud of it and it affirmed that art was my thing. You'd always find me sitting quietly in a corner somewhere, doodling pictures of robots. I always struggled with speaking as a child. I was pretty anxious and this caused me to stutter, something that I still struggle with to this day. And looking back, this was probably why I was so obsessed with drawing, you know, visual communication, because I couldn't find my own voice. So this led me down a certain career path, doing design and multimedia, as it was called back then, at college and university. And in 2008, I graduated and got my first job as a graphic designer. I thought I'd made it. Learning my craft and losing my way. So after a few years working as a graphic designer, learning the craft of design and working my way up in the company, I decided to set up my own agency and go self-employed. I did this mostly because I wanted to create something for myself, to carve out my own path, to build my own brand and create something that I could be really proud of. Looking back, I wasn't really focused on the actual outcome for the client. I was just so focused on creating nice looking designs. And being a cool young designer with a creative studio was really important to me. <clears throat> and being honest, I think I was actually pretty selfish when I think about it. I mean, sure, I did want to do good work for good people, but my primary driving force was really just being creative and designing stuff. I wasn't even bothered about making lots of money <laughs> because I didn't. So a few years went by creating that stuff, logos, branding, illustrations, animation, digital and print designs. I was working with a bookstore one day, a scientific research company the next, a German telecom startup the day after that, and really any old project for any old client. And in hindsight, the projects that I got the most from were always uh, a charity or something for a social cause. But I didn't really pursue these more ethically focused projects at the time because I was still very much focused on the act of designing itself. <clears throat> Until I found myself drifting a bit. I still loved what I was doing, but I didn't know really why I was doing it. I had no real direction or purpose, so I ended up being pulled around by others. Eventually, I found myself in a position doing work that wasn't fulfilling at all and designing things for clients who I didn't really share any real values with. So I became just a tool, a tool to be used, a designer for hire. 
And not only that, I also found myself being pulled into other roles, such as managing a small marketing team, setting up Google and Facebook ads, you know, getting involved in things that I had really no background or interest in because I didn't know what else to do. I had convinced myself that I couldn't do anything else and I was terrified that I'd end up losing work, not being able to pay the bills and rent, and I was genuinely worried that I would end up homeless. I was lost, I was burnt out, and I was depressed. Going against the grain. So for the longest time, ever since I was a child, I was fascinated by graphic design and branding how a powerful message can be portrayed visually without any words. But eventually I became disillusioned by the fact that this wonderful human invention, branding and visual design, was primarily used just to sell people more stuff that they can't afford and to increase the mass consumerism that is trashing the planet. I'd always had a bit of a polite rebelliousness in me, uh, quite skeptical of capitalist culture, consumer society, and I really hated how people are classed as consumers. And generally, I had this feeling that there's something not quite right with the way things are set up. <clears throat> and the more I learned, the more I discovered how unethical and unsustainable a lot of business practice seems to be by default. Now, I don't think people are bad, but the way our society and economy is built so it seems to encourage the worst, a fast track to exploitation and environmental ruin. And this coincided with me going through a personal journey. I'd learned a lot about the environment and how my own lifestyle, my holidays abroad, my meat heavy diet, my personal choices, you know, I'd, had all had a negative impact on the planet. And I didn't want that. So I set about making a lot of changes to my personal lifestyle, trying to live as ethically and sustainably as possible. And I eventually realized that I needed to align my business actions with these personal values because we spend so much of our lives working. So something had to change. The power of branding. So at this point, I'd worn many hats as a creative designer and I just and I felt just as uncom just as uncertain about which design discipline I should focus on as I was uncertain about my overall career and life journey. As I'd always loved logos, I was drawn to focus on that. I understood that branding was more than just a logo, however, and I learnt that the real power of branding lies in a deep and subtle place within us. Branding has the power to inspire change, to push movements forward, to shape public perception, and to influence people to do and buy things that they otherwise wouldn't. We all probably know deep down that you know, big corporations don't have our best interests at heart, yet we still buy into their marketing anyway. An emotional connection is made with us, whether we like it or not. I mean, the fact that clever marketing and cool branding has created a multi-billion dollar bottled water industry, when you can literally get it free from any tap, tells us all we need to know about the power of branding. Branding is powerful, branding is moving, branding is persuasive, and I believe it can be used for so much more. So defining my own values. <clears throat> Seemingly, just when I needed it the most, I found a business coach and decided to invest in myself to help me find some direction. Thus began a long and painful process of soul searching and rediscovery. The outcome of this was a better understanding of my own values, rediscovering what was really important to me and resetting my life and business to a more meaningful path. One that I had actually some control over. So I made this graphic you see here which shows four key areas that I wanted to focus on in order to have a purposeful business and a fulfilling life. So I value authenticity. 
and I need I needed to be true to myself to align my business actions with my personal values. So that meant to only work with those with whom I had a shared mission. Creativity. I've realized I'm really only good at one thing in life and that is my design. I've explored changing everything and becoming a sustainability consultant for the digital design sector. And I'm still involved in those initiatives. However, I'm always drawn back to my design roots. So I feel that I shouldn't neglect them. Instead, I need to use those skills to empower those who are doing great things, things that I alone can't do. And I must bake creativity and design thinking into every aspect of my life for that to happen. I care deeply about the environment. Having made some fundamental changes in how I live, I try to reflect this daily in my business practice and with my clients. And finally, contribution. I've done my time going through the motions and churning out pointless stuff. I want to make an impact with my work and create and contribute something to my community and the planet. Helping others find their voice. So as well as going through some business coaching, I also decided to seriously work on my confidence and my speech to overcome the childhood stutter that had been holding me back. And this was another really painful, but ultimately worthwhile experience. And I think what motivated me to improve my speech after 30 years of not really making any progress was discovering that real purpose in my business. So I learned that I wanted to exclusively help social enterprises, ethical business and environmental causes, but if I couldn't really communicate them with them, then I wouldn't be able to help them. And I found myself developing a branding process, which is called Find Your Brand Voice, which is designed to help these ethical organizations cut through the noise and position themselves for success. And this is the first step I take all my clients on when I help them meet brand. A better world by design. This is my motto to live by. It's also my company's strapline. And I really think that business and branding can and should be a force for good. Something more than just a tool to convince us to buy more stuff that we don't need, often produced by brands that have little consideration for workers or the planet. So I'm doing everything I can to tip the scales, to equip those who are doing good with the tools they need to succeed. And to play my small part to ensure that all business is ethical and sustainable and good for the planet and people. So I'm still that nerdy kid who loves to draw. I still struggle with my speech, my anxiety, but now I've got some purpose in my life and I'm trying to do better every day. So thank you so much for listening to my story and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions and have a chat in the QA section at the end. Thank you very much. Cheers, thank you so much, Will, for sharing that story and compressing all those years of learning and self-awareness into a really strong message about sustainability and being really mindful of, of kind of your day-to-day -day habits in, in your daily life, but also running a business as well. Um, actually, fun fact, Will is a really avid maker and collaborator um, in, in addition to his uh, regular work. Um, he recently, he just won a competition along with another team for Alex uh, Skills in EdTech uh, all around climate change. So really cool, another inspiring story of uh, collaboration in the kind of digital community here. Uh, so moving right along, as we mentioned, we have a break coming up next. So you got about five minutes. You need to refill your drink, go to the washroom. Um, and yeah, just join us back here. We'll be back in five.
Hey everyone, hope you all grabbed your favorite snacks, taking some time to chill out. Um, next up we have Bethan, he's going to tell us a little bit more about how she found purpose in her work and how, how she went through a few different stages in her career to get to where she is now. So it's going to stream into Bethan, live from somewhere near here. Hi there, my name is Bethan Vincent. I am the marketing director at NetSales. We're a product and software development consultancy based in York, and we build cross web and mobile for a range of clients, including Trainline, Uber, and Capita. And I am here to talk to you about pursuing purpose in your career. And I do think I'm perhaps someone who's uniquely positioned to talk about this. I have uh, a number of kind of, I guess, agendas. I've always tried to push forward through being employed or self-employed or a mixture of the two. And I do think that it's something that people should pursue what they care about. It's very important. It's definitely been a driver throughout everything I've done in my life. There are certain kind of, I guess, causes that I am very drawn to and very passionate about, the main one being climate change or the climate crisis, as we should call it, and helping mitigate the effects of that and trying to convince businesses that it is the right thing to do to reduce their environmental impact. So I'll give you a really short potted career overview, and then I'm going to get into essentially some of my tips for pursuing purpose in your career and some of the kind of, I guess, learnings I've had throughout my career around that and how I've kind of gone about it. So Potted history, I graduated from the University of York in 2013 with a degree in history. Not very useful <laughs> for the modern world, that kind of, but it, it wasn't something I wanted to pursue. So I actually set up um, my first business after graduating because I really didn't want to move to London and kind of pursue the more corporate career path. I very much felt that wasn't for me and it probably wouldn't have been, so I think that was probably quite a good choice. But I set up an ethical coffee company. Um, I was very kind of drawn to a lot of the issues surrounding coffee, especially from an environmental and uh, labour point of view. Um, often the farmers are very underpaid and don't kind of share in the success of the large kind of coffee magnates like Starbucks and Nestle. So that was something I wanted to change. It was a very interesting business to run, ultimately not that profitable because coffee is a volumes game, the margin was not great. But that was just the learnings you get from running a business and you kind of iterate and move on to the next thing. Next, I set up a ethical certification called Bright Ethics, which again was very interesting and very aligned with my values and the way I wanted to change the world. It sounds a bit cheesy, but that's always been kind of a driving ambition of mine. And after that, I ended up in technology. I built a set of skills around kind of um, digital marketing and kind of websites and things like that. I had to build my own e-commerce store for the coffee business. And I really felt that technology was a space that I could go into where I could make a lot of impact. If you think about the products and platforms you use every day, you know, they're embedded in people's lives. So if you can help influence them for the better, it's going to have a positive impact on the world. And again, it's cheesy. That's always been something that's been a driving force behind me, I guess, as a person. And it's what I've built my having a positive impact on the world around me is super important. So now I work for NetSales and continue to try and have a positive impact on the world around me. But in terms of kind of embedding purpose into your career, I think it's a really interesting topic because a, a lot of people just have a job and it's just their job and they kind of pursue their purpose, their passion outside of work, which is absolutely valid. I think there is also a set of people who purpose kind of is throughout everything they do. They want to make that positive impact on the world. And it's really important to them to find an employer or a self-employed route or a start a business that is aligned to what they believe in and the change they want to see in the world. And I think if you are someone who has that kind of like, it's, it, it's a feeling, it's like a gut feeling of like, I've got to do something that is going to make things better. You have to pursue that for a while and for certain jobs in my career, quite a long time ago, I definitely was working in areas or for companies I didn't believe in. And it was actually quite hard to do that. There was a lot of cognitive dissonance to that. So if, if you don't care to that nth degree, you know, pursue whatever makes you happy. And at the end of the day, we all need to make a living and businesses need to stay in business. But if you do have that kind of real passion inside of you, don't ignore it because 
it, it catches up with you eventually. I can, <laughs> can definitely say that. Um, and you will kind of start feeling the effects of that. So be picky with what you do. That's absolutely fine. I think also, as I've said, I care about a number of issues and there are a number of things that come through in my work and what I kind of am passionate about. As I said, climate change is probably the biggest um, climate, oh, I need to call it climate crisis. God, I can't even do one job properly. But I don't need to explain why that's important. Hopefully you understand, but that's been something that's always kind of come through in my personal life and in my work. But my kind of first point in incorporating purpose into your career is that you don't always need to stick to one mission or one kind of topic that you really care about. It's absolutely okay to kind of care about a number of things. So alongside being really passionate about climate and kind of helping businesses see that it's a real issue that we need to take action on now, we cannot wait. I'm also, for example, really passionate about getting more women and um, minorities into technology. And that's directly in line with kind of the company I work for is also passionate about that and does a lot of work around that. And the two can coexist. You don't need to pick one over the other. You can incorporate lots of different things as well. For example, I'm also passionate about cats. I mean, that doesn't always come through in my work, but if I wanted to incorporate it, I could. You never know. So you really don't need to stick to one mission and don't feel you need to stand for one thing as well. I think secondly to that, you can also change your mind about issues and topics. And I guess this is more a comment on the wider discourse in our society, which is often um, very kind of singular, shall we say, but it's absolutely fine to change your mind about things as you go. And for example, for me personally, the, the climate crisis issue has only become more important. And actually, I've made the decision personally that other things can take a bit of a back seat because that is kind of the main issue <laughs> that's going to define my generation and my lifetime. So I've kind of pulled back from other things and said, yeah, they're slightly less important to focus on what I'm in, what I really think is important. And engage in that discourse with yourself, with other people, I think more widely as businesses and as employers we need to be having discourses around what people are passionate about around their purposes and engage with them as topics and not just kind of leave them to one side and be tokenistic about it as well that can also be problematic i think as i've said you can set up a business that pursues a certain kind of passion or purpose for you my initial learnings from kind of the coffee business and bright ethics are that you need to be a profitable business to stay in business and you will potentially have to make compromises around your business model or some of the things you believe in you'll have to have some flex and there will be some things that are your like non-negotiables that absolutely you cannot do without or you cannot do because they are absolutely core to you but it is important to have a bit of flexibility and to understand that potentially your customers your suppliers your users may not be on exactly the same journey as you and people don't necessarily hold your own views and you can't expect everyone to kind of follow you you can be that kind of trailblazer but people will potentially be a bit slower you know you might be a massive early adopter you've got to wait for the laggards to kind of catch up a little bit and i think if you don't pursue the kind of business option of things and as i've said you've got to remember you've got to be in business to be a business if you go down the kind of more employee route it's really important to find an employer who shares your values and whatever they may be and it's absolutely okay to ask them about their stance on certain things so when i joined netsales i asked about women in tech because that's something i really care about and kind of what did they do around that and actually we engaged in a bit of a, a conversation, a discourse around it. And there was kind of a discourse about, you know, we could do more. And if you came on, it would be great if we did more kind of thing. And that, that was very a reassuring process. And it made me understand that the business was aligned with my values. And I could also pursue the kind of work that I am extremely passionate about. So don't be afraid kind of early on in the hiring process to bring that up. You may find it kind of sparks other opportunities as well. You never know. But also don't be afraid to kind of challenge your employer as well on certain things. And especially if they're making claims about being certain things or acting in a certain way, it's okay to kind of be like, oh, you say we're like this. Can you, what, how does that manifest itself? What's the evidence we're doing that or meeting that criteria? And I think, again, as employees, we 
we the people have the power you know we can influence wider business to like business decisions again with the caveat that business does need to stay in business to pay our wages <laughs> but you know we can exert that force and hopefully push for some change and that's kind of i've got another point written down here i've got some notes that says be more vocal and this is something i really wish bethan in her early 20s had the knowledge of or the kind of insight but i was really worried about saying things that people might not agree with and i don't mean saying like horrible things on twitter that are like you know defamatory or anything like that i more just mean standing up for what i believe in in a public way and throughout my career that has been the thing that's made me stand out especially as i get older i'm probably a bit more comfortable with standing up for what i believe in and i wish i'd done that earlier you know i wish i kind of said to certain employers like this is really bad we can't do this or be more vocal in meetings or be more vocal on social media if that's an appropriate outlet but it's it's okay to stand up for the things you believe in that's what this world needs right now and i think finally i i always think of this as what's your meatloaf line <laughs> so you know the i would do anything <laughs> for x but i won't do that and I think it's really important to have clear lines in the sand that you won't cross. And there are certain things that I know for me are a deal breaker when it comes to a job or a business or anything, or as a consumer buying from a business. And that makes it much easier to understand what you can A, flex on, also what is a non-negotiable for you? Because at the end of the day, we, we all have to kind of stand for something. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. I think that's the line anyway. But just think about it. What's your kind of meatloaf moment, your meatloaf line in the sand? But anyway, those are kind of my tips to pursuing purpose in your career. I really hope you enjoyed this. If you want to chat to me about it, obviously I'll be in the Q&A. But you can also find me on social media at Beth and Vincent. And you can also find out what we're working on at Nexiles. We've got some really cool projects at the moment. And a lot of them doing a lot of social good. We're working on a COVID rehabilitation app at the moment, which is very exciting. And you can find out all about that on our website, netcells.co. Okay, but thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. I hope you've enjoyed my bedroom backdrop. <laughs> this is it tidy. <laughs> but thanks so much for watching. Thank you so much for that, Bethan. Uh, really insightful just to hear your whole story. So I've been working on like a, a ton of different projects since I first met, met you like years ago. So just awesome to see how that's all progressed. So yeah, definitely check out her um, Instagram or Twitter to see more about her different sort of side projects. And also to check out her podcast. She's got a Brave podcast, which is really awesome if you want to, um, yeah, something good to listen to during lockdown. So, yeah, check that out. Next up, we have Lucille. Um, yeah, over to you, Lucille. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Lucille. I am the founder of Leeds Wellbeing Week and director of MindIt. And today I've been asked to talk about purpose of a profit for the founders event, which is quite exciting. Uh, so I just talk a little bit about my story, my mission, and also um, give you a few tips on how to find your purpose. Uh, so very quickly, my story, I did a business school in France um, and all throughout my business school journey, I was always looking for impact. I was looking for things that made sense. And um, all throughout my early career, uh, my first internships were at the IBM Foundation um, in France to work on pro bono projects on how people could, could use their skill set to have a social impact with um, charities, specifically. And, also, and then I had an internship in um, social finance, so how finance from a big invest, investment bank in France could support social projects or have um, more ethical approach, let's say. Um, then I left and I went to Cameroon for a few months to work for an NGO. Uh, to work on electric, electric waste and how we could um, support organizations to get rid of their old computers 
while rehabilitating them in order to give access to second-hand computers to families and small charities. So these three experiences were my first experiences in the working life. So you can see that there's already a thread in terms of looking uh, for social impact from a business school bench. Then I had uh, my first real job in a startup and we were doing a cash transfer towards Africa. The social impact was still there. I really wanted to find a job in a small structure with a big impact uh, when I first graduated. Um, it went well. I really enjoyed what I was doing for the first few years. And then very quickly, I realized that it was um, not really going in the right direction, that the social impact was getting lost uh, and that the organization was really focusing on uh, raising funds and raising more funds and um, obviously being profitable, but then the social impact aspect was lost. So that's where I um, ended up leaving the organization and uh, ended up in Leeds for personal reasons. Um, at the same time, I also almost burnt out after these uh, startup experience, uh, being so busy all the time, um, never stopping really. I love my job so much that I was um, always full on. And I soon realized um, that I was going uh, too far and that I was leading my way to burnout. I talked about that in quite details in another talk with uh, Consume Cons that I think you can find on um, YouTube, on their YouTube channel. Um, so all in all, after the startup experience and then the almost burnout uh, that I experienced when I arrived in Leeds, I decided to do burnout prevention. So from my story, from my looking for impact, as well as my personal um, burnout, I decided to uh, really focus on prevention and how we can avoid burnout in the first place. Um, so very quickly, burnout is uh, when your body tells you to stop, when you've been going in that wheel of life very, very fast and never stopping. It's not always work. It's not only work. Very often it's also related to your lifestyle and to your personality. So there are the, these three elements combined, uh, a lot of work or uh, quite the opposite, being bored by work, a very intense lifestyle, and at the same time, a personality uh, of someone who uh, is wants things to be perfect or wants to have control, etc. So there are several elements of burnout and uh, how I um, ended up making this mission a reality, I created two um, structures. Leeds Wellbeing Week is a wellbeing festival that happens every year uh, in the spring and Mindit is a limited company that um, gives workshops and training in organizations. So on one hand we have Mindit for um, organizations, companies, charities, any type of organization. So usually how the business model works is that there are organizations who pay for a session or a training uh, course for their employees and then the employees can access it for free. And on the other end, there is Leeds Wellbeing Week, which is not necessarily for the employees. It's for Leeds citizens, anyone who want to access um, well-being events. Uh, can access them. We put together a series of events throughout Leeds Wellbeing Week. Uh, most of them are for free or at a cheap price. It's mostly financed by Mindit, so the limited company finances um, the Wellbeing Festival to support Leeds citizens wide and large. Anyone who wants to try new things, who wants to um, get access to some well-being sessions, can access them during Leeds Wellbeing Week. And during that festival, we also work in partnership with many well-being organizations. Um, uh, anyone who does physical well-being, mental well-being, emotional well-being events, 
we worked ha hand in hand together to put a program together so that as many people as possible can access them. So the, the business model overall um, of Mind It and Leeds Wellbeing Week who work hand in hand, um, it revolves around prevention. Um, we talk about burnout, we talk about how to spot the signs of burnout, but mostly we give people the opportunity to empty their stress bucket, to uh, get rid of that stress feeling, uh, because burnout happens when you're when you go from adrenaline rush to adrenaline rush and you never stop being stressed. So you have that constant uh, adrenaline feeling and you never relax. So we give people that opportunity and that space uh, to, to relax, to uh, do activities um, that helps their mind and body to avoid burnout. How do we add value? Uh, we try to do it differently than um, other organizations. So it's a combination of these three things that you can see on the screen. A combination of uh, group sessions versus individual. We don't support individuals one-to-one. Uh, -one. We work with experts who do support individuals one-to-one. -one. So if people after a group session want to have more one-to-one -one support, they can. But our main um, activity is to do group activities in the workplace as well as in the public space. In the workplace, it's a bit tricky right now because of the COVID situation, uh, but we have turned all our sessions into virtual ones and we noticed that people interact quite a lot. We uh, managed to still do interactive sessions using, using the chat, uh, using some polls that we can find um, on some tools, etc. So we really, really focus on group sessions because connecting uh, to people, talking with each other is key to maintain well-being and is key to prevent burnout in the first place. If you spot the signs of burnout at any point, talking, reaching out to people uh, is one of the biggest steps that you can make. The second element um, is practical versus theoretical. We really focus on practical sessions with a series of activities. Um, it's not theoretical. We don't talk about you. We don't talk to you about stress and anxiety or mental health in theoretical terms. It's very practical. Very often it comes with um, a booklet uh, with some activities or exercises that you can do at the same uh, time as the expert is speaking or explaining the activity. Uh, just uh, to invite attendees um, to take action, but also to reflect on their own experience. And then finally, the, the last element about how we add value is about incremental versus radical. We invite people to take incremental steps at the end of um, each session that we make. Um, if you notice that you um, have been very stressed lately, we don't ask you to stop all your activities, to quit your job, to uh, leave your family and to change life completely. Sometimes that's the only option that you have but in most cases you can make incremental changes and take incremental steps to feel better and overall adjust um, the things that make you feel too stressed or stressed too often um, so we focus on group activities always very practical and we also invite people to uh, take incremental steps that's how we add value um, session after session. And as you could see in the previous slide, we also add value by providing sessions in the workplace that enable us to support uh, people in the public space, specifically in Leeds. And now my top three tips on how to find your purpose. So for me, it was always um, obvious I wanted to work in something that had impact that made sense so how I would describe it to you is these three questions uh, that I can think of when I think about my journey and how I ended up uh, doing burnout prevention in Leeds um, 
who would have guessed? Uh, so my first question is, what drives you nuts? And it's related to your values, um, to your story. Um, in my case, what drove me nuts is that my grandmother um, had a meltdown in the 70s. My mother had two burned out, burnouts um, uh, later in life, and I almost burned out myself. And I know it's not just me, uh, my the woman in my family, uh, or French people in general. Uh, it's it's a big issue, and it drives me nuts that there is no prevention uh, done. That people take it for granted that uh, you need to work hard and you need to put your body to the extreme in order to be successful in life. I'm not going to go down that route about the redefinition of success, uh, but that's one thing that I can talk about for hours. So try to identify what drives you nuts. What is the thing that you can go on and on and on about? Or that thing when you have that feeling whenever you talk about it, that it really makes you um, angry or upset. Now, the next step is um, how you can contribute. It doesn't mean that you need to stop the business that you do right now um, or that you need to quit your job or you know do the, all the extreme decisions. There are many gray zones in the middle. In my case, I ended up uh, moving to Leeds for personal reasons. So I started from scratch because that was the opportunity there. Uh, but maybe um, for, for your, you or your business, it's about setting up a small um, charity support in the charity that actually um, does the work that you think is really important to you. Um, so that, that can be one option. That can be for you to start doing some voluntary work uh, one afternoon a week on your uh, working day or during the weekend, depending. So finding that purpose, but also exploring the, the gray zones, the, how you can adjust the life that you have and the impact that you have so that it fits more with your values and your personal story. And then the third aspect, of course, the third question is what's your first step? So going back to the incremental steps I was talking about earlier, uh, what's your first step? What, what can you do today or tomorrow um, to take that first step and uh, find a bit more sense and impact um, in your life and in your business? So I really hope it helped. Um, it was a short uh, introduction to what we do at Mind It and um, Leads Wellbeing Week um, and how they work hand in hand together in order to support more people in Leeds and all in all in order to um, avoid. Okay, thank you very much Lucille for that. Um, I mean, those are amazing takeaways actually to when you think about finding your purpose, not to kind of be overwhelmed that you need to have it all figured out right away. I like those actual steps, basically finding out what kind of really bugs you, but then also figuring out, okay, what's the first step that I can take um, and then just find one cause that I can contribute to. So um, again, thank you for those really actionable tips. Um, and our final speaker of the night, moving right along, we have Rich from Agency for Good. So we'll hand it off to Rich. for good um, and yeah we've got some awesome speakers so far assuming I'm still going last um, so I'm going to talk to you a bit about purpose over profit today as is the whole theme of the event and um, what I do want to do I'll talk a little bit about um, ourselves obviously um, but what I want to talk about is why I do what I do um, why you should maybe put a bit of purpose uh, into your existing organizations um, and then some of the benefits that you might get from that as well. So, on to what we're here talking about. So, as mentioned, I'm Rich from Agency for Goods. I'm, I'm the founder, and um, we've been going for, for about 18 months now. Um, so, I had about 14 years in sales and marketing. Um, I've worked all over the world in loads of different industries, um, but even through that, I was never money motivated, weirdly, for a salesperson, marketing person. Um, and I, I just, I really always wanted to help people in whatever role that I did. Um, obviously I help with Leeds Digital Drinks, 
Um, I sit on the board for Mind and Health, which is a, a mental health social enterprise. Um, I sit on the board for Social Enterprise Yorkshire and Humber. I'm also a mentor for Heropreneurs, which uh, helps ex-forces start their own businesses as well. So a bit of background, so fairly regular childhood um, from zero to 15. Um, quiet kid, very shy, still am. Uh, some people might disagree with that. And then at 15, I found alcohol. Things turned south. Um, and I was a bit of a shit, to be honest, between the ages of 15 to 25. I uh, did some things not proud of. I'm sure we've all, all done similar things. Uh, but then I met my, my amazing wife and, and my life turned around um, when I was 25. And from there, uh, I was still working in, in sales and marketing and um, I set up my first social enterprise when I was 31, which did cooking classes for people with additional needs um, or in low income to, to help show them how to eat healthier as well. That failed for a lot of different reasons, but I learned a lot. Uh, I went back into the, the corporate world and um, like I say, 18 months ago, I set up agency for good. Um, and hopefully it's going to continue uh, on an upward trend from now. So my background, I love running. If anybody's ever spoken to me, you'll get bored of me talking about running. Um, pretty much exclusively listen to movie soundtracks, uh, composed or, or otherwise. And I love sci-fi, particularly The Flash. Um, and weirdly, it's it's a bit of one of the, because I'm so heavily into sci-fi, superhero stuff, it's weirdly an inspiration. It's about doing the right thing. Um, and yeah, I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, later on. So agents for good are an ethical agency supplying marketing and digital services to people who uh, have, have a social purpose. Anyone trying to make a positive impact in society and, and genuinely believe that we can increase that social impact by helping people with marketing, with digital, however that is, but done in the right way. Um, and we price a lot differently to a lot of agencies out there. We don't believe charities, social enterprise should pay what anybody else pays. Um, to be fair, I don't believe what people pay. A lot of the time they should pay anyway, but that's my own personal opinion. And we then they can use their own income to make more meaningful change. So I use uh, teams of freelancers. It's a way of keeping our costs low so we can pass on those costs. Don't have an office. This is my office here. Um, so yeah, we use some of the, the best freelancers around. Uh, I'll talk about how you might, if you want to get involved with us at, at, towards the end as well, but we cover all, all different aspects of, of marketing and digital as well. So the, the reasons I do this, I, I came across quite a lot of things over the years and I hate seeing people taking advantage of. So charities paying four grand for, for a website is to me just disgraceful, uh, like particularly early stage charities or social enterprise. Um, I just wanted to do something that gave a bit of meaning to my life, really. Um, and I always wanted to help those most in need. And, and I realised that I could use my years of experience to help those helping people. Uh, it was the most effective way that, that I could do that. So, yes, we're, we're a social purpose organisation. Um, we deliver free marketing strategy advice, sales advice, commercial advice, whatever it takes to help those charities or social enterprise and give six hours to each, um, whoever wants it basically. So we've done, given 701 hours away in the last 18 months to about 182 different organizations. But then we've got 78 paying customers, not necessarily from those 182. We work with smaller businesses as well who, are, who want to spend their money on and know where the money's gonna go and it's gonna go on to do good. So we've got the balance of profit and purpose right as it stands and this is just a random picture of a goat so I understand profit's important and um, if you don't make profit we, we can't help people um, and it's always the funny one which one comes first the way we did it was we went down with the purpose route first I wouldn't advise that to many people starting out um, you've got to have that profit there uh, to be able to help people but uh, as Brands have said the brands that will thrive in the coming years are the ones that have a purpose beyond profit. Um, and Forbes, I don't know how long ago they said this, but we'll see. Uh, businesses that ignore the, the sort of purpose side of things, that, that trend will be on life support in four to seven years. And that is becoming more prevalent now as well. So there's a lot of issues in the world. I'm not going to go on a doom and gloom 
thing with you today. So these are the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And these are all areas that everybody should be trying to help towards in their own way, um, do whatever they can. Um, I'm not going to go through each one of these now. Um, just just have, to have a look at these. There's a lot, there's a big partnerships going together. Um, but if you can help with one of these, it's going to help the world overall, basically. Looking at our country specifically, and this, these figures are from the Joseph Browntree Foundation report from uh, 2018, I think. So this is developing to be very different after COVID. So 14.3 million in poverty um, and 4.5 million in deep poverty. So that's where they can't afford to eat um, or can't afford to have meals consistently like, like a lot of people do. So there are, there are issues there that need solving and there's loads more than this. I just wanted to give that as, as one example to highlight it. One thing I would say is purpose and profit are interlinked. So people will have these conceptions that, oh, well, I haven't got time or money to like give to charity or whatever it is that you're looking to do. But there is a clear link uh, between the two. One thing I will say at the start of this is if you're going to look at bringing more purpose into your organization, do it for the right reasons. If you don't care about something, I'd probably say don't do it for, for two reasons. One, it's, it's disingenuous, but two, people will see through it as well. So just be careful around that. But if you're wanting to do something, these are some of the benefits that, that you can get out of the back of it as well. So it's getting more quality and loyal customers. So 87% of consumers said they'd be willing to buy a product or service based on the company's advocacy of a social matter, whatever that social matter is. 55% uh, of consumers will actually pay more um, for those who have help socially as well. Um, and you can actually see an increase in customer loyalty because they, they respect the company more for trying to help society. If you're looking at bringing employees into the business as well, there's, there's lots of arguments to say employees, particularly younger ones now as well, um, want that social purpose there as well. So you, if you've got a, a solid social purpose as part of the organisation, uh, you'll increase engagement and product productivity. Finding talent will be easier, not easy, easier, and keeping that talent will be easier as well. So 94% of the Gen Z uh, think companies should be addressing these issues. 67% um, of people prefer to work with socially inclined companies. Um, and you can reduce turnover by getting people involved in these social projects in, internally as well. Um, and engagement levels, um, go from having one person engaged out of 10 to one person engaged out of 1.8, which is pretty impressive, really. And these figures are from Deloitte. Um, I can share the, the figures just in case people don't believe what they are. Um, and marketing as well. Um, it's easier to market yourselves um, and you spend as little as 10 to 25% of the, the industry average on marketing if you've got that purpose. People are willing to talk about you, showing you what you do. It just creates great PR. So what are some of the things that you can do? Um, and it's, it's going to be different for every organization. And I'll say it again, do it for the right reasons if you're going to do it. So you can have a look at just your practices in general. How do you treat your staff? How do you treat your customers? Just simple stuff. Um, look at your supply chain. So bring, if you so try new social enterprise in your supply chains, because they're, they're, they're going to use any of those profits to go on and help others. There's this, Again, a preconception around social enterprise saying the services that they deliver aren't quite as good as anybody else. And that's just utter rubbish. It really is. Um, in some cases, because they really care, they, they tend to be actually better. Um, you could just donate and that's great. Do it, do these things in the right way. Research, make sure that the charities are really helping people and look at local ones as well if you can. Um, there's lots of issues all over the world and people need our help, but it's nice to keep it, keep it local if you can. You can even partner with um, with charities, help them promote themselves. You could set up a foundation, you could set up your own charity arm, you can just volunteer, but have a think through it. But again, have that cause in your mind and, and try and do these things for the right reasons. Uh, Blake Mykoski set up Tom's in 2006. Um, he saw poverty in Argentina, but he, he saw that there's an, an espadrille that he, he started off with uh, making these shoes. So for every pair of shoes he sold, he sold, he gave one away. 
um, to these impoverished areas. That's changed recently. They, they now give away every pound for every three pounds they make for various different reasons. But they're currently valued at around 400 million or billion. I forget. It's, it's a lot anyway. So you can be purposeful and be profitable at the same time. So feel free to get in touch with us. If you want to chat to me about how you can add more purposing, because this is something I advise businesses on. Um, you're a freelancer that wants to work with us and put a bit more purpose into to what you're doing. Um, and also, you're, you're a business and you want actual market and digital services and want to know the profits are going to be used for good as well. And I'm just going to finish with, uh, again, going back to the sci-fi. So um, everyone changes the world, everyone. Uh, it's scary, but that's kind of the deal. And it's how much you want to change the world and how you want to change the world. Um, and that's Diego from the Umbrella Academy that I just noticed the other day. So thanks very much. I hope that was useful. Um, and feel free to have a chat with us at any point. Take care. Yeah, cheers for that, Rich. Um, if you want to learn more about some of the funding opportunities you mentioned, just make sure to check out his website. So yeah, uh, that's a wrap for the talks. But we just wanted to say some quick thank yous before we sign out. Sign out? It's live stream. Yeah. Uh, firstly, a huge thanks to Duke, Duke Studios for making this event happen. They generously allowed us to use their live, live stream facilities and have a whole range of awesome services available, which you can check out on their website. Yeah, and uh, next we want to thank all the organizers uh, from the Consume team and Lee's Digital Drinks. So it's not just my lovely co-host here up on stage, um, but there's a whole team of people working behind the scenes. Um, so I wanted to give a big shout out to them as well. And also just thank you to all the speakers who kindly put time aside during lockdown to work on their talks and generally being for being an inspiration to others. And lastly, we want to uh, finally thank everyone who dialed in this evening. Thank you so much for spending your time with us. Hopefully you've been inspired by the talks. You can take away some of these insights um, and apply them to both your projects and businesses as well. And we're obviously very keen for um, the continued build in the community. So please tweet us, please DM us on um, Twitter and our Insta. Um, if you comment on the YouTube, um, we'll see those and we'll respond to you. Um, we've also, at Consume, we've got a couple of events coming up, as do the Leeds Digital Drinks team. So uh, keep your eyes on the social, because we'll be announcing those. In particular, Consume Community. Um, so our next event is on the 6th of October. Um, as Consume Community, we will be um, talking about creativity. Uh, our event will be Creative Courage. What have we just made art for us? Um, so that's the next one that's coming up from us. Yeah. And we guys. have a couple as well. So um, over the lockdown period, we've been running an initiative called Least Digital Makers. We have the last two sessions of summer coming up. One is happening this Thursday. The next one's happening on September 10th. And then we have uh, our next big event, Design versus Tech, and that's happening at the end of October. But um, as Anna was saying, stay tuned to our socials for all the details. Cool, okay. So yeah, if you'd like to continue the conversation we've been having this evening, um, please feel free to join the Zoom chat afterwards and we can all get a bit crazy like these little birdies. Um, yeah, it's the, the link's either on the event by pra event bright page or in your inbox. So yeah, join us in the next like five minutes. Um, see you there.